Okay. So for those of you who are joining us this evening, sorry for the technical issues. Um, I'm not sure why uh, Zoom is not letting me connect to Facebook this evening. Uh, but we're so excited to have Christopher Reich with us to talk about his newest book, uh, The Palace. Uh, he is the New York Times bestselling author of The Take, Number to Count, Rules of Deception, Rules of Vengeance, Rules of Betrayal, and many other thrillers. His novel, The Patriots, won the International Thriller Writers Award for Best Novel in 2006, and he lives in Encinitas, California. Technical issues aside, how are you this evening, Christopher? Great, and happy to be here and, you know, getting used to this new uh, world we live in. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of guidance on, like, how to troubleshoot when Facebook just won't cooperate. Um, we're so excited tonight to talk about uh, the new book, The Palace, which is the third in the new series. Do you want to start off by giving us a little bit of an elevator pitch for the new book? The elevator pitch, I like that, sure. So this is the third book in the Simon Riss series. Uh, at the first, it's, it's interesting, you know, who is Simon Risk? Uh, Simon Risk is an American living in London. Um, he's about 40 years old, and he is a man of kind of warring personalities. Uh, growing up, uh, he spent some time, he was living in the south of France. He was involved in organized crime. He was famous for being one of the best car thieves and kind of had a real taste for, for crime. And and escalated to robbing armored cars and ended up uh, being shot and, and doing a, a stint in jail. Um, and during his time in jail, he kind of underwent a, a spiritual transformation. So when he came out, he decided to kind of leave the dark behind and then kind of seek the light and kind of obey the angel on his shoulder instead of the devil. So, so as a setup, that's who Simon Risk is. He's had a terrible, difficult childhood He's tough as nails, but now he's devoting his life basically to good. He was a banker, and they found out he had this, to borrow from uh, Liam Neeson, this unique skill set that enabled him to uh, undertake uh, missions and, and assignments for uh, intelligence agencies, for multinational corporations, for wealthy individuals, the type of assignment that people wouldn't or couldn't do for themselves or didn't want to be anywhere near being seen to do. So that, who, that is who Simon Risk is. And so in book three, as it opens up, uh, it opens up on a boat in the south of France where he has been sent to steal back a, pre a precious Monet painting that was stolen itself from a museum in, in Holland about 20 years before. So these are the kind of, kind of assignments that he does. Works a lot with Lloyds of London, uh, regulating or, or finding lost items. In this case, as I said, he's finding a lost painting. Um, then it escalates, he gets back to London and finds out that one of his oldest friends uh, and, and trusted friends has been put in jail in Thailand, uh, in Bangkok for extortion. And his friend has, has reached out in, with the police saying, you know, in the kind of a secret code they have, you got to get me out of here. This is really serious. And it's more serious than, than you even know. So, you know, minutes later, hours later, Simon's on a plane to, to Bangkok to free his friend. And there, of course, complications ensue. And within days, Simon finds himself on the run, the target of a multinational criminal investigation as he tries to unravel a gigantic financial fraud that takes him from Bangkok to Singapore and ends up, of all places, in Cannes, France. All right. Um, so I read. Have we reached the ground floor? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I read somewhere that uh, Simon was actually based on um, some people that you kind of met or knew as you were doing research for for other books. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I don't know exactly how right that is. Um, I think he's more of a composite uh, of people I've seen and met. Uh, I think Simon's a typical example of someone that when you meet him and say, "God, you know, I want to be just like him." Um, not having undergone uh, the kind of rigors of his life. Uh, so when I set out to write this series, it's funny, I had finished my Rules of Deception series or written three of those books. And then I was searching around for an idea for something new. And uh, at first I was going to write a story about kind of an everyman, um, uh, an American who worked like a little bit in the defense industry, but is really empowered by the, the tools that are available to all of us these days. One of the themes in a lot of my books is what I call the, the super empowerment of the individual these days, you know, with, with our access to, you know, our cell phone, you know, 
all the knowledge in the world, but also with all the high-tech gadgets that basically humans and anybody can go to a store and buy anything from MZ catchers. Those are things that uh, they pretend to be cell phones, cell phone towers. And they allow you to, to capture other people's uh, uh, cell phone data and listen to their phone calls. I mean, it just goes on and on the ability for one person to do what it used to take an entire intelligence agency, you know, hundreds of people and billions of dollars to do. So yeah, Simon is, is just, my favorite part about him is while he'll present like you and I, he looks great in his suit and tie. He's very, has a great sense of humor, but inside of him is a dark, dark man who's done very, very bad things. And he's kind of always on the edge wondering, am I going to do those again? Or will I really have the desire, you know, to, to engage in that type of criminal behavior once more? Uh, so one of the things I think that kind of we love as thrillers is we, you know, we want to fall in love with the main characters, characters like Simon, but we also want to be taken kind of on this fast paced ride. So how do you balance out being able to create um, kind of characters with depth while also kind of keeping that, that pace of the action so quick? Yeah, it's funny. I write the kind of books that I love reading. You know, I say I grew up reading the classics, uh, Frederick Forsyth, uh, Tom Clancy, uh, Len Dayton, and of course, Robert Ludlum, okay? Now, I don't know how great all of those were in character development, but they were certainly great in action and suspense and plot. And um, I do try to add a layer. I think that people want the emotional connection with books. You know, when I'm reading a story, the chase only matters if you really care about the character and if he's gonna make it out of there alive or not. Okay, so I do try to spend time putting a lot of myself and things I see into Simon. Um, he's definitely a multi-layered character. Uh, as I say, he has a great sense of humor. He's a ladies' man, but you know when push comes to sub, you do not want to be on the business end of this guy. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think that all the best writers these days really pay attention to, to the character development, and they look at Harlan Coben as thrillers. You just love his characters so much. They're so sympathetic right from the first page. Yeah. And that's an example I definitely try to follow. Um, and so you've done, um, like you mentioned, you know, you've done a, uh, a couple of series and you've done kind of a lot of standalones as well. So when mm -hmm. you're starting a book, do you go into it knowing you're going to be working on a book in the series or do you know that, that this one's going to be a standalone? Well, this one, I've been doing the Simon Riss books for about four years now. This is the, I'm right, I'm right here up in Mammoth Lakes, California, in the beautiful high Sierras at 9,000 feet. And I come here every year for about two months to lock down and finish whatever book I'm writing, in this case, the Simon Riss book. Um, so I knew starting the series that I wanted to have a, a very long running series. Yeah. You know, I love series. I love Jack Reacher. And I can't wait to get that. Um, so I said, I want to, to do something like that. You know, I love Daniel Silva, Gabriel alone. Um, these are the type of books that I like reading where you have a strong central character. And each book though is basically a standalone because you don't have to read any of the past books. And therein lies, I guess, the, the pleasure for me in the challenge, which is I get to revisit these characters, make them more in depth, learn more about them myself as I write them, but then send them off on completely different, wildly varying stories. You know, the first book, my first book, The Take, takes place in Paris. Uh, and it has to do with a stolen, a letter that's been stolen from a Saudi prince. The Saudi prince is secretly the head of the intelligence service. And boy, everyone wants to get that letter. It's, it's like the MacGuffin. It's like everybody finds out that letter's gone. Everybody's after it. And they, they enlist Simon to go find this letter. What's in that letter? Uh, the second book, Crown Jewel, is set in Monte Carlo primarily and then in San Moritz. Um, and it has to do with a very sophisticated band of um, gambling thieves or the thieves that rip off casinos uh, with very high tech methods based all on truthful, uh, real occurrences. And so, like I said, that's wildly different. One, you know, one's very uh, geopolitical, one is more just a crime. Mm -hmm. The palace is he's trying to find a friend and then he stumbles onto possibly the biggest financial fraud uh, in history. Um, so I think that's one of the cool things about long series like that is that you can tell that it's part of a series because like, it's like uh, Daniel Silva does this so well. Like he pulls in all of these network of people that he works with. And so you can clearly tell like in a book like, oh, he's worked with this character before on another adventure. 
but it doesn't impact that story. It just kind of inspires you to want to go back and figure out what those earlier adventures are. No, I love that. I, I've read all of his books and, and he does that so well with all of his characters. And you want to see how the character, the, the, the sub characters, you know, his colleagues and cronies, what's happened in their lives. And so I think that, you know, when you're writing a book a year and, and you want the reader to come visit you, you know, once a year, uh, something has to happen in these people's lives that makes them interested. Say, oh, why do I really want to go back and see what happened to, what happened to Simon Risk? What happened to Lucy Brown? What happened to Harry Mason? Some of the characters to D'Artagnan Moore uh, in my books. Have you been tempted to pull any of the characters or anything from any of the standalones into Simon's world? Not yet. I may, I may actually do it in this one at the very, very end. Um, but that's because I have a lot of things happening in my film entertainment front that might be interesting to kind of bring over. But for right now, I keep each universe separate. Yeah. So as you're working, do you create like a Bible for the series? So that way you can refer to it back as you go, <laughs> kind of starting out on it? Oh, John, I wish. I wish there were a Bible. <laughs> uh, no way. And I think some of the fun is that it's just wild and woolly. I mean, I do, I do plan out each book. Like I'm writing this book now. I know, you know the beginning and I know where it has to end. Um, you know, the, the hard part is in the middle when everything kind of goes crazy, but uh, there's no Bible for the long term. Yeah. You know, uh, I know Joe Rowling said that after J.K. Rowling, when she was writing, writing Harry Potter, like after the first book, she really had an idea of everything that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure I believe her just because <laughs> when you're writing, everything changes. Once the magic happens, when your pen goes to paper, that's mm -hmm. when the real ideas come. And I just... I don't think you can completely plan because so much is kind of serendipitous and spontaneous. Yeah. So, so how much um, do you do like kind of an outline when you start and how much of the, the finished product actually looks like that if you do? Um, I don't really actually write the outline. I have it in my head. I read tons of books and have ideas of what I'm going to do. Um, then I'll sit there and I will write like a one sentence of praises for the first like 20 chapters mm -hmm. outlining, you know, so I know the main characters, who are the main characters. Uh, in these books, there's Simon, there's a bad guy, there's usually, it has to be female interest, um, and then other ancillary characters. So I know who they are. Okay, I get that set up, we write about them. You have, a, I wouldn't call it a Bible, but mm -hmm. a few paragraphs about each person. And then, uh, then off you go. Yeah. You know, and I know how it's going to end. I kind of know what, where it has to be aiming toward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course, as you're writing, I'm still doing research and reading books. Yeah. And as I said, ideas come to you when you're writing. So uh, you mentioned research. So what kind of research do you do um, like into like specific, like the artifacts and being able for the, to be able to seal those or even kind of the financial stuff? Well, it's funny with the palace, I set out from the very beginning saying, this is going to be a book where I'm going to travel the world and write the book in each location where the story is taking place. Mm -hmm. So I started the book, I was, I think, January 3rd, I flew out to, to bank and um, I was going to be what they call a digital nomad, you know, just live with my laptop. I'm lucky enough, I, my, both my daughters are 23, or almost 23 and, and almost 21. So they're off on their own. And um, I says, my internet connection is unstable. Anyway, we're good. So anyway, so I decided to, to, to go do that. And um, so I, the first, more than half of the book uh, of the palace takes place first in London, then in Thailand. So I was really able to just, you know, breathe the air and I was out on the streets every day and visiting the surrounding countryside. So I hope when you read the book that you kind of really get this sense, kind of get the grit of what it is to be in Thailand, the smells, how the people are, wonderful people, by the way, uh, just a great, great country. And, um, you know, then from there, I went to Malaysia. Uh, I took this boat to literally an island that Robinson Crusoe would have lived on. And I had like four huts and I stayed there for a week, had some goats, had a couple monkeys. If you go to my Instagram page, Christopher Reich Books, you'll see this picture, these cute little monkeys. I would never want a monkey as a pet. They are horrendous. So cute, but they do whatever they want to do. You have no control over them. Um, then from there, I went to Singapore uh, and then, you know, over to Europe. So um, I, one of the, I think hallmarks of my books is uh, authenticity for the locations. Um, I lived in Europe for a long time and was able to place a lot of the, use a lot of the details um, from my experiences there. So yeah, location is very key in my books, you know. 
And, and so for the, those of you who have found the Zoom, if you guys have any questions, definitely drop them in the chat and we will make sure to get to those. Um, so were you able to travel to the locations for the book that you're working on now before everything closed down? It's funny, I got caught this, this time closed down. I was, um, I started this book and then I went to go visit uh, my daughter, my daughter Katya, who was living in Bolivia oh. at the time. Uh, this was back in early March and she was doing an internship with the World Wildlife Fund. So I went to go see her and when I was there, everything got crazy. And I decided just to stay with her in case something might happen. I mean, she's flying on her own. Um, but boy, then they closed the borders and they, they shut down the country. And so I was there. And luckily we had a great Airbnb and she moved from her apartment and moved in with me. So we were together for seven weeks and um, you know, we hardly left the apartment. And it ended up being one of those things where you kind of make lemonade out of lemons. Mm -hmm. And I was able to really strengthen and renew my relationship with this wonderful kid who's my daughter. And we just had a wonderful time. Awesome. We've got somebody else popping in. Thanks for joining us, Nancy. If you have any questions uh, while we chat, you can drop them in the chat. Um, we've had a couple of people watching with us. And again, we apologize for the technical issues. Um, Let's see. So you mentioned, you know, kind of living all over the world and your books are kind of set all over the world too. Um, can you talk a little bit about how just kind of being able to travel like that has had an influence on your writing? Well, I kind of bring my, my just my background in, in the way I grew up into my books. So my father was Swiss, Willie Wolfgang Reich. He came to America in 1956, but then he was sent, he was in the travel business and he was sent over to Japan so I was born in Tokyo and lived there until I was about five. In fact, I barely spoke English until I was three and a half. I had these wow. Japanese maids with us back in the day, this is in the early 60s, on a salary of about $1,500 a month. In Tokyo, you could have three maids and have a house. It was living like the life of Riley. So I was learning ba baby Japanese. And um, in being in the travel industry, my father was able to allow us to travel all over the world growing up. So, I mean, every summer I was off to Switzerland or, you know, faraway points. And um, I just got used to that. That just used to be, that was me. That was my life. And uh, so I went to Georgetown's School of Foreign Service, wanting to be a diplomat. Um, I didn't realize that test was so hard to pass. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Went on to become a stockbroker, went to the University of Texas Business School, got my MBA. And um, then I went to work in Switzerland. I'm a Swiss citizen, I have a Swiss passport. Uh, so I went to work at the Union Bank of Switzerland in February of 1988. And so all that, my experiences there were on display. I used those to write my first novel, Number to Count, uh, which came out in 1998. So all my books really uh, use this great experience I've had traveling. I mean, I'm a travel bug. I love traveling. I never like being in the same place. And, and I love, you know, infusing my books with that feeling of, and letting the reader kind of close their eyes and think, oh my God, I'm sitting on a, on a mountainside in Switzerland right now, and there's about to be an avalanche. <laughs> uh, which would be great right now here in Texas, where it's, you know, we're getting like a three or four day string of like hundred degree uh, temperatures. So um, and humid uh, in Houston. So humid. It's so humid. We had air conditioning issues at my house here yesterday, which would have been fine because it was just in the guest room, but my husband's a teacher. And so they just started back virtually. So our guest room is now like his virtual classroom. So we had to get, luckily it was an easy fix. So we were very worried yesterday when the air started shorting out. Um, so, why are you sweating so much? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so do you still remember any of that Japanese that you learned as a baby? Very little, very little. Um, konnichiwa, komawa, ohayou gozaimasu, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but here's the thing. When you learn a language early in life, it programs your brain to allow you to learn other languages much more easily. So I learned English, but then I've lived in France. I speak French. Not, I would say, I think it's fluent. The French would laugh at me. Uh, I speak German pretty well. Uh, so there, not, when I was in Bolivia, I was learning, trying to learn as much Spanish as possible, uh, even though quarantined in a house, you know, 23 hours a day. Uh, but it, it is really important to try to learn a language early to really, you know, to have a facility for them. Yeah. 
Um, I also read in an interview that you, you mentioned um, when you are starting a book or before you start a book, you kind of sit down and think about kind of what you would want to read, what you want to take on vacation, what you wish you had um, on your nightstand next to you. Can you talk a little bit about that process of kind of when the books are starting to percolate? So that's, I always think that because, you know, people ask you, well, Chris, when you became a writer, how did you decide, you know, how did you know what you wanted to do? It's like, man, it's like, I write the kind of books that I love to read. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Born Identity, one of my favorites, The Day After Tomorrow by Alan Folsom, um, every book by Len Dayton, uh, every book by Frederick Forsyth. It's in my blood. Okay, so I can't write anything else. That's what I'm going to be writing. That's, what I'm thinking. That's just the way I think. That's kind of, I think I, I view life that way, that everybody on the street might be coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a natural, you know, I say I write the kind of books that I love to read, fast paced, international very exciting, but smart. Uh, my books are always pretty intelligent. They always take into account something current and what's going on in the world. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, what, I, I, these days I read a lot of nonfiction. I'm reading The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson right now. Yeah. But what does it take place? World War II, first 1949, and it's a fantastic book. Of course, all of his books are fantastic. You can't go wrong with Eric Larson. Um, uh, but then I also have Alan First, who's one of my favorite, F-U-R-S-T, the great, I mean, World War II novelist, I mean, non pareil, uh, just the best, um, you know, and oh, and I have the next Daniel Silva book that I have to get into, you know, The Order. And so, gosh, I, I kind of read, the, I even read the books I write. <laughs> Which is great, you know, so, so often we hear people talk about like, hey, I used to love these, these thrillers and stuff like that. And once I started writing them, I couldn't read them anymore. So it's nice to hear that you actually still are able to kind of read that while, while you're writing it as well. But only the best ones. Yeah. <laughs> We've been really excited. You know, there's been a huge movement um, with publishing the last couple of years to be able to just go back and reprint a lot of that stuff that wasn't available for a long time. So like a lot of those Lynn Dayton books like in the last year or so have all been back in print. We used to get, when I first started working at the bookstore 10 years ago, we would have people come in and ask for them all the time and we just couldn't get them. So like they're coming back. It's been really great to see stuff like that be available for people to explore again. I, I, I can't tell you how much I love Len Dayton and I read his books all, all you know, those Bantam paperbacks all through my teenage years. Bomber, SSGB, Goodbye Mickey Mouse. I mean, you know, the, the game set and match series. So. The good thing about Len Dayton was also important in my career for another reason is that he didn't start out as a thriller writer. He was kind of a newspaper reporter. Then he was writing cookbooks, cookbooks. Okay. Huh. And he decided to write thrillers. I can't remember what his first, first one was, but um, I read that going, you know, I was an investment banker then I was running this watch company, but I had this desire to be a, a writer. It's like, well, Len Dayton was a, writing cookbooks, I think. I, I could make it that transition too. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I also think is always really interesting is how thriller writers, especially um, now, deal with technology in their work, especially right. because it just, it changes so fast. And I know that you mentioned when you were working on Invasion of Privacy that it was basically kind of, you know, what would happen if your iPhone kind of turned against you. So when you're working on something, how, how aware of you are how aware are you are you of kind of technology and how fast it changes so that way you can write a book that's still going to feel relevant and not feel dated? I, I, you better be. I mean, any writer these days, you better be on top. You better be reading CNET, Wired Magazine. I mean, I do every day because so much is happening. On the other hand, I think the, the iPhone or the cell phone is the worst thing that ever happened to, uh, to thriller writers because... Mm -hmm. They're constantly, they can get all the information they need and they're constantly yeah. contactable. It's always good when you don't have a phone, you have nothing, you're all running on the run and no one can get you. That's just not the case these days. Um, in the, in, with regard to Simon Risk, he's a bit of a tech specialist himself. So he keeps up, he knows how phone works, he knows how to toy with them, he knows how to listen in on everything, on, on people. Um, he has, a, he has a, a colleague who helps him more, um, Vikram Singh. Uh, Anyhow, uh, you better be aware of it because, I mean, it's going so fast. The hard part about writing thrillers is I, John, am finishing a book in the next month or so that will come out next year, 2021. Goodness me, what advances are going to take place in these next 12 months? I don't know, but there will be plenty. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, one of the things I love, like I went back pretty recently and read uh, Mary Kay Andrews's um, books that she wrote um, in the 90s. Is that the Sparrow? Check. Huh? Did she write The Sparrow or what did she write? Uh, no, she wrote the Callahan Garrity House Mouse Mysteries and now she does kind oh. of more beachy summer, uh, summer read stuff. But mm -hmm. those great, those books that were set in the 90s, like her character would have to, you know, drive across town to go find something. She couldn't just like pull out her phone and look stuff up. So it was really, mm -hmm. they were really kind of dated in this really charming way because she actually had to kind of do a lot of that legwork that you just don't see detectives have to do anymore. Um, and, you know, as authors have pointed out, there are only so many ways you can have your character, you know, not have a charged cell phone or be in an area where their service doesn't work. There's only so many uh -oh. options to get out of that. There's no, the reception is really bad here. <laughs> My phone's not coming in. It's like, oh, do you have at and or Verizon? <laughs> <laughs> or even just the way that like people talk about having to end calls now. It used to be like you would hang up the phone or you could slam down the phone and now it's like, and I pressed the end button and the phone call was done. <laughs> I always just say like the call ended or yeah. ended the call room and, and you move on. It's kind of like one of those things, like, especially for young writers, it's like when, when you're having a conversation, it's best just to say, he said, she said, not he retorted, he protested, he sighed. It's like, just say, he said, she said. So it becomes invisible in the reader's mind. So the same thing like with calls, the call ended, boom. I don't need to make that fancy. Call ended, boom, move on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, your process of getting published when you were just starting out? Yeah. You're looking at literally the luckiest person <laughs> in the world. I never wrote one query letter in my life. Wow. So I am, um, well, so anyway, so I was, uh, I'd been running a Swiss watch company, uh, Giorgio, Montre Giorgio Beverly Hills, G Giorgio Beverly Hills watches. And um, I did my best to make it successful. Then it mm -hmm. started doing not so successfully. I'm kind of just kidding, but um, <laughs> I fell in love and I got married. And, uh, and my boss says, Mr. Reich, you can't, and she, my wife, uh, my ex-wife worked for my company. She was head of marketing. They said, well, you can't, you guys can't work together. So she's fired. When they fired her, I said, okay, I'm going to start something. I'm going to do something else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, what should I do? I said, well, I want to become a novelist. You know, I want to be a writer. I was age 33. So I was still very young. And, um, and my ex-wife looks at me and she goes, well, tell me, she goes, did you take many English classes in college? I said, I didn't take any. She goes, have you like, are you been writing like short stories I don't know about that are hidden in your desk? I said, I haven't written any, but I just think I could do this. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I know you could do this. I know you could do this. And so that confidence also, you know, I had plenty of my own confidence, but her belief in me propelled me to quit my job running this watch company, very well paid job in a beautiful Switzerland. We moved back to Austin, Texas, um, uh, where I'd done my MBA at UT. Look at my horns, baby. Love it. I love Texas. I love Austin. And uh, I set out to write my first book. So, you know, a couple pieces of advice. First, you know, with writing, you only make a first impression once. So when you finally turn in your manuscript, it better be as darn good as you can make it. So I sat down and I applied the same rules that I did when I was an investment banker. Um, I worked all the time. So I'd start work by 6.30 and I'd stop at five, which is a really long day when you're writing a book, okay? It's really long. And lo and behold, I started May 1st, Christmas day. I had 660 pages finished on my first book, Numbered Account. Here's the secret. I showed it to some people who I thought, who, who uh, I, I recognized and respected their opinion. And one of them who was doing a master's degree at UT in English said, Chris, you know, your writing's pretty good, but I have no idea what the story is about. It's just crazy. And so I said, okay, oh, I was humble. I started rewriting it right then. And I really applied myself. And four months later, I kind of rewritten a little bit. And here's the lucky part. My parents were also very supportive. And I'd been telling them, you know, I'm writing this book. And, you know, they're basically think I'm crazy. You know, I should be back in a bank somewhere. Um, anyhow, so I sent them some of the pages and they forwarded them to a friend of the family, a man named Farlin Myers. Farlin Myers at the time was a senior VP at J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency. Do you know who the president of J. Walter Thompson yeah. Advertising Agency <laughs> was in 1996? James Patterson. Wow. The hardest working man, I think, in the planet. This guy just goes 24 seven. Um, so James Patterson, or as we call him in my house, 
St. James, <laughs> he read these pages. He, this busiest guy, read these pages. And he goes back and he gives them to his literary agent, Richard Pine in, in, in New York. And um, lo and behold, about three weeks later, I get this call from Jim Patterson saying, Chris, this is Jim. I read your book. I really liked it. And you know, I've never done this before, but I'm going to recommend that my agent, Richard Pine, take you on as a client. What do you think? I said, what do I think? I said, thank you. That's fantastic. And you know, an hour later, Richard Pine calls. He goes, hi. He introduces himself. As I read your book, it reminded me of those really early Ludlum books that were so fantastic and atmospheric and just nonstop action, you know, and he said, I would like to represent you. And I said, well, that's a no brainer. So, so that's how I got started, you know, and that's how I got my agent, you know, but that's when the work, that's just when the work begins, you know, you, you, sit, you have an agent and we rewrote that book, number to count. We rewrote number to count from May until almost end of January, uh, nine months later, over and over and over again. I, I could have read that book on tape verbatim, just out of my memory, you know, and humility, listen to what people say. You know, you're not the best writer. I remember one time I handed in a, a draft and I said, what's wrong with it now? And Richard was incensed. He goes, what's wrong with it now? He goes, Chris, he goes, you're in the big leagues now. He goes, you know, you think I'm wasting my time, you know, spinning my wheels just to tick you off by telling what's wrong with you? He goes, there is something wrong with your book and we're going to keep working on it until we get it perfect, you know, and I could sell it. I said, wow. I said, okay, point taken. That's, I've, I've heard lots of people get how they've gotten started stories. That's one of the crazy, that's, that's amazing. Jim is, I mean, I, we should call him St. James around the bookstore too. Cause I mean, just everything that he's done for not only other authors, but just independent booksellers and kind of the book industry as a whole. He's just, mm -hmm. it's, we're so lucky to have him in our corner. He's truly a great man and, and, and the nicest person you're ever going to meet. You know, he leaves his yeah. ego at the door and he looks you in the eye and uh, he gives of himself. So Mm -hmm. we're, all, we're, all, we're agreed on James Patterson. Yeah, he um, was in Houston last May doing an event with the Barbara Bush Literary Foundation and his publicist mm -hmm. was like, hey, Jim's going to be in town. He's got like two or three hours on this one day. Can he come sign at the bookstore? And we were like, Jim can do whatever he wants. We are so, yeah, so we cool just, we had, you know, we just set up a signing and he just sat and chatted with people for like two hours, stayed as long as he needed to, to chat with everybody. And then um, we got to spend some more time with him at VoucherCon in Dallas. And yeah, we're all, we just, just love him to death. Um, so when you guys were working on numbered account and you were going through those revisions after revisions after revisions, was there any point where you thought this isn't working? I'm just going to put this aside and start something else. No, no, no. We knew it was a winner. That's why he took me because they knew it was going to be successful. Um, but like, here's, here's, for example, people go, Chris, you know, you're quite a good writer. Uh, what kind of um, changes do they ask you to make? <laughs> I said, oh yeah, you think so? And so when I first wrote Number to Count, um, I love books on tape. I love books on tape. And my favorite writer is John Le Carre, the British spy novelist. I've read all those books and I've listened to them all. And he reads most of his books. He's by far the best reader I've ever heard. I mean, he's just fantastic. So when I sat down and I was writing Never to Count every day with my pen, the voice in my head was like a voice that sounded very much like John Le Carre with an English accent. So I remember I handed in my book and Richard reads it. And the first thing he says is, Chris, first question goes, your hero, Nicholas Newman, he's a former United States Marine, correct? I said, yes. He goes, and he's from California, right? I see, yes. He goes, therefore, he's an American, right? I said, yeah, of course, he's an American. He goes, well, why does he talk like Sherlock effing Holmes? <laughs> so the first thing is we had to take 660 pages and strip out all of his dialogue and Americanize it. Awesome. So that's the kind of mistakes you make. Yeah. And do you think, I, I'm, I know the answer to the question I'm going to ask anyway, but do you think that the writing process has gotten easier now that you're this far in, or is it still... I mean, I'm sure you probably have a better idea of kind of what's working and what doesn't when you're working, but do you yeah. still sit down and think like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing? No, I, I think, I've always thought I knew what I was doing I, to an extent. The point is you, earlier I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm right, um, I've really learned how to tighten up my prose. I used to overwrite wildly and I just realized that when readers read, so much goes on in their imagination. Mm -hmm. You don't have to lead them every step of the way. 
just set them on the path and they'll have these great ideas on their own. And so I think my writing has become much more concise and tight and, and much better. You know, after 14 books, I certainly hope so. Um, that doesn't mean it's easier because you're always struggling with stuff. And now I'm struggling just to make it, to say, it's like poetry. Mm -hmm. It's just to say the most, convey the most emotion in the fewest amount of words. And that's hard to do. And that's when your muscle, your brain just gets contracted. It's like, I can't figure this out. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to say this. Uh, so I know the palace has only been out for a couple of weeks. Um, if y'all are watching, Christopher has been really great to send us some signed book plates. So if you order copies, uh, you can order them from murderbooks.com. We will throw in a signed book plate for you. Um, or if you are new to the series and you pick up one of the earlier ones, we can throw in a book plate for that as well. Uh, can you tell us what Simon's going to be up to in his next adventure? I can if for once I have a title for the next book. It's called Once a Thief. And so you know what the other part of that is. Once a thief, always a thief. And this is a book where, I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit diabolically clever, but um, Simon kind of has a little bit of a, not a nervous breakdown, but he kind of decides that maybe he doesn't really want to stay on the right side of the law. And he gets involved with some people that bring him back to, to the man he used to be, which was the meanest, baddest MF ever. You know, a man that loved emptying a, a cartridge of an AK-47, who loved to break people's knees, who could steal a car faster than anybody else. And he has to use all these skills to, to kind of forward what he's up to. So it's really fun to write because, you know, when you're writing these books, it's always hardest to write the protagonist that's good. It's always easiest and most fun to write the bad guy. <laughs> you know, what's more fun than writing the bad guy? Dr. No or Christian Zell from Marathon Man, you know? Those are the characters. Is it safe? That's what you want to write. So this time, Simon gets to be the bad guy. And I mean, it's a wild ride. Uh, it starts off in Pebble Beach at the Monterey uh, car auction. Uh, goes back to London and ends up uh, heading to points east. I won't give any more than that, but it's fun. Awesome. So uh, you mentioned that you actually have a title for this one, or title something that are hard to come up with for you um, for oh, book. The worst. Titles are the worst and the most important. Um, uh, it seems I have, my books have the best success when I have a great title. My first book, Numbered Account, uh, Numbered Account. I mean, there you go. What's the story about? It's about a numbered account in the Swiss bank. You know right there, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, the timing of that book was very fortuitous because a lot of shenanigans was in the news about Swiss banking. A Rules of Deception, a great title. Uh, what are the Rules of Deception? That was a gigantic hit for me. Um, uh, and then, you know, with Simon Risk, we were taking it. First, I was going to call it just Simon Risk. Um, but then we said, yeah, what's something a little bit catchier? And so we love the take. And, and so, you know, titles are hard. Um, it's fun. Uh, with these Simon Risk books, they've really, they've caught on, they've done well. Um, but now we are uh, starting to make a television series Ooh. from Simon Risk. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, produced by Amy Powell, Brillstein Entertainment, uh, E1. Uh, that's the same team that does Jack Ryan on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. So a super A-list. We have a great actor. I can't say his name. Mm -hmm. Yet there'll be a big announcement. We have a great showrunner who's writing it, who's had written some fantastic movies uh, and TV shows. So uh, that should be getting going filming in the new year. Uh, but, you know, people just, the fun thing about Simon Risk is it's like an update on To Catch a Thief or It Takes a Thief. It's, you know, a bad guy who's, who's now doing good, but still uses his skills as a thief and as a, as a criminal. Um, I think we could all kind of relate with that, uh, with what's going on these days uh, in politics and elsewhere. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. Before we tune out, just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, we are still closed at Murder by the Book uh, for the public to come in, but we are uh, doing curbside and mail order. So you can give us a call at 713-524-8597 or visit us at uh, murderbooks.com and we can get anything you want. Um, we're happy to make recommendations over the phone. So if you are not sure what you want to read, uh, we definitely recommend Christopher Reich's books, especially, like you said, if you just want something that's fun, fast paced, smart, you want to be able to travel when we can't right now. Definitely pick one of those up. Uh, Christopher, thank you so much for being patient while we tried to figure out. Um, I will um, send your publicist info as soon as we get the videos uploaded so you can share thank those. Out. Um, and you mentioned, you know, loving Austin. Let us know next time you're, you know, in and around Texas. We'd love to, to actually thank get to you. I certainly will, John. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye Have bye. a good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye.